people have powerful feelings about the traffic in Los Angeles. It says something that local officials warned motorists about a temporary road work closure on the 405 last year by calling it Carmageddon. Angelinos took the hint, and this weekend they're expected to steer clear of the latest 405 closure, named, of course, Carmageddon 2. That's how it is in L.A., a snarl of overstuffed freeways and commuters who keep their cool, except when they don't. KPCC's Stephen Cuevas has this profile of a punk rocker whose music expresses the insanity of L.A. traffic while extolling the virtues of public transit couple of things you need to know about Eddie Solis. He lives in L.A., loves the band Kiss, and does not own a car. Being someone who's from L.A., born and raised, and, you know, having a few cars in my past, um, I saw the city much differently through a different perspective through the eyes of a bus rider. Want to just go all the way to the back? Sure. Line 18, Wilshire Western Station. Just steps from the front door of his home. Across the street from a tortilla factory in L.A.'s Boyle Heights neighborhood, Solis catches a bus that connects him with the city's subway and the commuter train he catches to his day job at an indie record label in Hollywood. It just opened me up to, like, little neighborhoods, galleries, clubs, bars, just everything. Just seeing what's out there, little pockets of the city. Solis' journeys aboard L.A. buses and subway cars informs a lot of the material on The New Los Angeles Part 1, Through the Eyes of a Bus Rider, the latest release by the singer-guitarist band It's Casual. In Solis' vision of a new Los Angeles, people abandon their cars, climb aboard public transit, and rediscover their communities. One song extols the virtues of the L.A. County Metropolitan Transit Agency's Easy Pass and the urban underbelly it introduces to the rider. And that's an, like a nod and homage to, you know, the people who know what you can even go cheaper and really beat the system and really steer away from spending money on gas and oil profits and all that. It's all it takes for me to witness racial tension, for me to witness illegal aliens. It's not to paint a negative picture, it's just my perspective of what is seen. Off the bus and back on the street, we make our way past a jazz saxophonist playing for pocket change and down a long escalator to catch a train. So, where are we now? We're at the uh, Red Line Station, the uh, Pershing Square Station in downtown LA. And what's our destination? We're going to go downstairs another tier, and about five minutes we're going to get on the Red Line going northbound. Okay, yeah. let's go. The Metro Red Line snakes from North Hollywood to downtown Los Angeles. It's the train that inspired its casual's signature tune and spawned a viral internet video. It was partly filmed late at night on a moving train as it hurtles from station to station. Solis thrashes away on his guitar and barks the lyrics, which celebrate the Red Line and call out the congested freeways that coil around Los Angeles. Este es un tren de Metro Red Line a North Hollywood. The freeways are not so nice. The I-5, the 210, the freeways are not so nice. The thread that comes out of the record that ties everyone together is just like, be alive, don't don't be a victim of having a car. <laughs> MTA spokesman said he couldn't comment on Eddie Solis's furious pro-Metro message, but the Red Line video was a hit at the offices of Move LA. Ah, Eddie's done a good job. Thank you, Eddie. It's the public transportation advocacy group headed by former Santa Monica Mayor Denny Zane. He liked the juxtaposition of Solis blissfully riding L.A. public transit in one scene with scenes of the band raging against those notorious freeway jams. Eddie is all frantic when he talks about highways. And so mellow when he's like grooving on a skateboard and on the bus and on the red line, there's a metaphor for the transformation, you know, from the, oh, my God, I just got to get out of the traffic to, 
Hey, this is cool. I can mellow out. Or you can blast the tune like too many people as you claw your way across Los Angeles by car, bus, or skateboard. Too Many People could also be a motto for its casual. Over the years, the band whittled itself down to a power duo of Solis and a rotating cast of drummers. So you may think the burly, bearded punk rocker just can't get along with freeways, with people, or his native L.A. Not true. I love it. I love everything about it. I've traveled throughout the U.S. many times, and I could never look forward enough to coming back. The weather, the different cultures, the landscape. I was just like, you know what? Now I know why everyone moves to L.A. <laughs> Solis will bring the love and the volume. During a Red Line mini tour next month, It's Casual will play a different venue within walking distance of several Red Line metro stops from Union Station to West Hollywood. For the California Report, I'm Stephen Cuevas. That's the California Report, a production of KQED Public Radio in San Francisco. Our director this week is Nina Thorson. Seal Muller is our technical producer. We had additional engineering from Danny Bringer and Howard Gelman. Thanks to Hank Hadley at KCBX. Our online team includes Lisa Pickoff-White, David Marks, and Don Clyde. Our interns are Catherine Borgeson and Rachel Johnson. Tyke Hendricks is our elections editor with production help from Tina Lauerberg. We had editing support from Paul Rogers. Victoria Malion is our associate senior Senior producer Ingrid Becker is our senior producer. The news director is Bruce Kuhn. I'm Rachel Myro. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend. This is the California Report. Funds for the California Report are provided by the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California and supporting the California Report since its premiere in 1995. And the California Endowment. Health happens in schools at calendow.org. And Chevron, investing in renewables, strengthening communities, and creating jobs. More information at chevron.com. Welcome to the 87th episode of Los Angeles Nista. I'm your creator, producer, and host, Edward Solis. And this is another downtown Los Angeles episode with my in-studio guests. 
from Siblings Clothing Showroom. Sure. Israel Ramirez, how are you, man? Good, man. How are you, Eddie? I'm fantastic. I love the fact that uh, we're getting together once again. Yeah, man. Yeah. Reconnecting after Reconnecting all these years. after all these years. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to articulate um, how much contrast is involved with being Angelino. There's a lot of great things happening here. Yeah. A lot of uh, Absolutely. different people, a lot of different geography, a lot of different walks of life, a lot of different, uh, you know, food. A lot of different industries. Cultures. Yeah, industry, you're from El Sereno. Yeah. El Sereno. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, let's talk about, uh, you know, the 90s growing up. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, we had a pre-production meeting. Yeah. And it was an interesting time because that's when a lot of people in their teens were making path, you know, joining joining a path and, and, and making a decision where to go. Whether yeah. it's, you know, the dark side being gangs and tag banging yeah. or, you know, Staying on a straight path and getting into pioneering a, something, pioneering yeah. something. But you know, go you get your education or you don't, and then yeah. you actually go in there and create something. Yeah. Um, you and I have both seen a lot. Yeah. You know. Um, and we still chose the paths we chose. Yeah. But that leads me into, even though we're very um, <clears throat> creative and have artistic output within our lives, I think we take a lot of that harshness that we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes out. With finesse. Now, something that's very interesting is that uh, you spearhead a company called Sibling Showroom, and it has to do with fashion. Yes. Also, you take on lines and you get them into stores, so you're a distributor. Yes. Now, when you went to college, did you know you'd be doing this? No, not what, at all, actually. What was your major? I was a psychology major. Um, you know, kind of went to college to discover myself. I had yeah. no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I was playing music for a long time and realized, you know, I need to find a way to make money, uh, find, you know, income. And, um, you know, finished school, uh, talked to my sister who had been in the industry for a good eight years before me. And she just sort of gave me a, you know, a background, told me like, you know, it's a fun industry, bunch of creative people, awesome opportunity. It's perfect industry for someone like you who's likes to be personable, likes, likes to network but also likes to be around creative people. And and sure enough, you know, my, my first couple months working with her, I just, I loved it. You know, it, it was this real satisfying job. Um, just the people I met, you know, from entrepreneurs to designers to artists to tattoo artists who had clothing lines to musicians who had clothing. I mean, it was every, everything I wanted out of a, out of a career. And, um, you know, did it with, alongside with her for, for a good five, six years. And uh, then she sold me the business and I am now the sole owner and um, hired my younger sister, brought her on board. So kind of, you know, continue the cycle of, of you know, helping family and bringing family into the business. And, that's, uh, that's fantastic yeah, because a lot of families don't do that. Yeah. A lot do, a lot don't. No, we hear that a lot. You know, people are like, I can't. I can't stand working with my, or I, I couldn't stand working with my brother or sister. And I'm like, we love it. We enjoy it. We, you know, we you guys love each other. It. We, yeah. You guys we really, have each other's backs, you know, that's in a way amazing. that I can't, I wouldn't have with anybody else. So that's this tremendous thing to have. When I walked into the market restaurants and met your sister and my other sister, yeah. <laughs> and was talking to you and went upstairs to the showroom yeah. and met your, your sister also that works for you. Yeah. I just, was immersed in this camaraderie yeah. through family yeah. and it was priceless yeah. and it was just so abundant and so healthy and yeah. it brought, it, it resonated with me yeah. and it made me happy and it was just like so strong. Awesome. And so it's so, um, with that stigma and that vibe in your business, I mean, you must show up and you have that vibe looming over you. And it's really probably a magical day every day to to be in business for yourself with your sister working, yep, yep. and especially in a competitive industry, yep. where it's just, the competition is fierce. Where it's fierce, and it could get a little, a little cutthroat, a little ugly, you know, right? People, you know, in our industry sometimes can be, you know, you know, it's a fashion industry, so you do come across a little bit of, you know, pretentiousness. Sure. So, I think having her um, keeps me grounded and. We like to portray ourselves as good, honest, hardworking people that sort of earned our way, you know, to where we are. We, we're we here because we, we've earned it. We're a product of our parents, you know, our parents' hard work and the values and principles they taught us. So, you know, we try to 
put that into practice in everything we do. And I think my clients, you know, they, they, they see that and they respond to it. So, uh, it's, it's worked out for us. It's worked out for us pretty well. You know, we have a pretty good reputation out there. I have a awesome, uh, you know, associates or partners in, in clothing designers that work with me and they're great people, people that I support, people that I, you know, I'm happy to be par partners with. So. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know <clears throat> I think it's important that you articulate with, um, the work that goes behind getting clothing in a store and getting paid on it. Yeah. yeah how how many steps, how many steps like, like, to, you know, I want to paint a picture for all the designers out there that yeah. have a dream yeah. that says, I want to, you know, I have this line. I want to get it picked up by a distributor and into these stores. Talk about all the work you have to do. It's, it's, a, it's a long process. You know, and I've been part of, you know, small startups, you know, worked alongside so small startups to like big, you know, big companies that have like huge infrastructure, huge backing. So I kind of seen both, both sides of it, how, how things can be done. Um, I think, you know, you always begin with, being true to something, you know, you, anything you do, any product you, you put forth has to be true to who you are and true to, you know, you, who you've become the, the years. And, and then, then you start looking at the market. All right. What's missing in the market, you know? So you s sort of evaluate things you see. Yeah. Okay. Fill the voids. Fill the voids. Um, then people come to me and my, my job is to help them make their, their product or their, their clothing a little more marketable, a little more accessible sort of just hone it in a little bit, you know, um, sort of see, okay, there's an opportunity with a specific customer base. Let's, let's tweak, you know, your line certain ways to, to make that, you know, to make it accessible to those people or to that customer base. And then we go through the whole process of design, you know, sourcing, sourcing fabrics. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, I think my perception of it or my ideas of it before I started was like, oh yeah, like clothing design, like how complex can it be? But it's, it's a really complicated thing. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of, you know, individual vendors you deal with. There's, and then there's the, the whole like construction and, you know, and just coming up with ideas on a consistent basis. That just seems like the hardest thing to do. You know, you're done with one season, but you move on and it's start all over again. You got to make that, you know, past last season better than, than the current one. So it's yeah, a lot of work. keeps raising the standards and elevating, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And that takes work. It takes a lot of mental and spiritual, uh, I think communication yeah. within yourself, like to bring it out. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, to always be thinking of new, new ideas and ideas that are going to be, you know, good for consumers. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to do. You have to be, you have to be have your your finger on the pulse, you know, at all times. You can't you can't just step back and sort of take something for granted. You just always have to know. You know what? It could all be gone in, you know, in a, in, in no time. Yeah, so, yeah. As 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 uh, you know, it always comes down faster. Yeah. So that's keeping that consistency, that great attitude. Yeah. And a, a very strong grasp on your industry yep. is what keeps everything above water. Yeah. Yep. And it and it takes. You have to do that with finesse, yes, and not do that in a rigid way. So it's like it becomes a burden. Yeah. If it's a burden, then it's like, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, if it's a burden, then what you're, you're gonna that's gonna translate into into your product. You know, yeah, you have, you have to enjoy it. You have to have a passion for it, have a, pr a pride for it too. So, yeah, it, it, it all it all kind of works together. Since you're in the position you are in in the fashion fashion industry, yeah. distributing lines of clothes yeah. into retailers, yeah. What advice do you have for the kids at FIDM and other places, people that want to create their own line and get it in the stores and have a great career and of uh, abundant life through their the clothes are made? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing, and I think I've mentioned this to you in the past, is, you know, reputation. Just start with your reputation first and foremost. You know, connect with people. Always, don't ever take for granted the, the small situation to the big situation, even small situations matter, you know, small uh, connections with people, people that you don't think are that important, but they might be important later. It's One just, thing I learned working yeah. in the music business yeah. was treat everybody equally. Equally. Every situation equally. And, and it wasn't like, it's just, first of all, it's just part of being human. Yeah. Be good to everybody. 
there's been people I've met because I couldn't do something for them in 1996. Yeah. They would ignore me. Yeah. That person's not even in the music business no more. Yeah. You know, that's when, you know, I was an intern climbing the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had run into situations where I've been in positions of power where I am um, a gatekeeper somewhere and I'm able to get people things, you know, and um, I'm able to, uh, part of my job description is selling into, into accounts mm -hmm. and some of these buyers in really small stores want the perks that the big guys get. I'm yeah. like, and so I would do my best to hook them up with promotional tools and get them on the, on the guest list, all these shows from the bands connected to the label. And those people have gone on to leave those little stores and work at Apple mm -hmm. and iTunes. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, they remember those things. Yep. So it's really just a very big on an even kill, right? Yeah. With everybody. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I think with, with students at FITM or people that are, you know, trying to break into the industry, you know, I, any break you'll ever get, it's not because of how, you know, how boastful you were or, or how it's just, a, it's mostly someone referring you. Mostly it's a word of mouth thing, you know, and I think any break you'll ever get is, is through someone else. It's through someone remembering you for, for just hard work or for just honest, honest ways of doing things. It's just all that stuff matters. So, you know, that's why I say, you know, you, you treat every situation, whether it's, I'm working with the buyers from Nordstrom and Urban Outfitters to like the mom and pop store in like, you know, some small town in Northern Cal or something. You just treat every situation as as important, and, and everything's important. Yeah, everything's important. That's uh, that's real hands on experience information that you're providing. Yeah. Um, do you think that w within your industry there is a lot of room for new things? Always, but you know, with with the internet, it's made it a lot more difficult. You know, it's it, the competition is pretty fierce nowadays. You know, there's there's a lot of people trying to you know get that space in a store you know some someone told me there's a uh, statistic the other day there's over 30,000 clothing lines in my business right now wow and and you know these stores are boutiques whether it's you know American rag Fred Siegel I mean they could only take as many as 50 brands at once so there's not a, I mean it doesn't even matter how good you are no or that you can get your stuff in it's like well they take it because of the space yep because of the space and you know I think you have to have you know like we were talking about a good story <laughs> you have to have your oh. your product has to have it just cannot be just about the product anymore it's the good it's backstory multi-dimensional it's a multi-dimensional thing now you know where yeah you need a good backstory you need press you need buzz you need you know, you sort of have to pioneer something before even a retailer considers it. You know, it's not just like they're going to try something just because it looks good, you know. Absolutely. I have this, I have this, um, this theory that, you know, you have to, um, you know, first of all, things take time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm sure people have the, uh, this perspective that you just kind of throw things to the pipeline and get, you get paid on it. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, you got to pick up the phone and communicate what the item is. Yeah. You have to, uh, you know, explain what these things are. You have to show them through, you know, digital content and maybe any kind of uh, books that you may have. Um, and then there's presentations. Presentation. I mean, you got to get there so they could see it if they're, if they're able to do it that way. I mean, there's a lot of work to get that pre-order. And then all... You have to convey that with confidence, too. You have to convey... Conviction. Conviction, yeah. I mean... With your present, like you're saying, presentation, you know, language and communication is important. You know, knowing your product inside out, knowing your market inside out. Those are all things that that matter to people, you know, when when they're spending money on you, when they're going to drop, you know, whatever amount of money on on your on your clothing line or on or on anything, really, like you're like we were saying. Um, but no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Tell me, um, what are some of your favorite places in downtown Los Angeles to uh enjoy yourself whether it's going to see music or you playing music yeah because you also play music a band, yeah. Tell, let's talk about the name of your band my band is regime noir right uh, with a uh, four-piece band I've been playing with them for close to eight years now so that's sort of been my my creative outlet i mean playing music since i was i commend you for that because yeah. um <laughs> the um i just came up on 10 years of my band yeah. a decade you know and it's a good feeling and i just had uh 
4 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. this evening, I had uh, Gene Troutman. Cool. Plays drums in Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah, 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 cool. Um, and he was like, man, you know, 10 years or even five years. He's like, that. a lot of bands break up after one year yeah. or two years. Yeah. So that's a good milestone. It's a really good milestone. And I think you take the good and the bad, good experiences. I, I always tell Chris, my, my bandmate, you know, like, I enjoy it. I look back and I think of like just the, the the moments we thought, man, that was such a crappy gig, or that I can't believe that went wrong, or and it's just like that's just part of the adventure, you know, being in a band, and we're lucky to still be able to do that, you know. It's kid as kids, you just look you look to have those moments at some point, and just the fact that you got to do them, playing like some place that you random place in like you know middle of nowhere America, you're like no PA system, or you just have to like wing it somehow but somehow it becomes a, a story a memorable story exactly it's part of the of the makeup of of the band and the band's story so i i think those moments matter just as much as the the good one the great ones yeah know? yeah what about um music venues in los angeles so let's focus on downtown is there anywhere that you like to go see bands i um, go to the smell a lot um i go to you know for a long time there's been really cool sort of independent like Parties thrown in random warehouses here in downtown. I've been going to a bunch. Remember, Hangar 18 for a long time was absolutely a awesome place. You know, to go to to go see shows. Um, Plastic Factory, which is a little bit more early in the 2000s, fun place. You know, where it was just just the community of anybody's fashion designers, writers, artists, painters, musicians. Just hey, we need somewhere to all just come together and just exchange ideas. And I think. That's one thing downtown has. Um, I'm not sure if it's still as, as you know, it's as relevant now as it was like back, you know, in the early 2000s. Because um, I think it's developed a lot more here. A lot more, you know, true professionals are moving in, and a lot of the artists are starting, right. starting to move out. Um, but I think I think it could still be a good hub, you know, a central hub for for all of us, for all natives, for all artists just coming here to like absorb take in the city take in the, the the way of life here and you know re bring it out in their art in our artwork and and so i think I mean, we we still need that we're always going to need that you know every big city has that and mm -hmm. you know i think the more we all come together we all share ideas we all exchange ideas no matter what art form it is it's all important you know it's all so important you know to to the community and to us you know banding together and making and making a a statement, you know, about the city. Right, yeah. right. I think, you know, <clears throat> when the city was underdeveloped in the 80s and 90s yeah. and even early 2000s, for us, it wasn't like this. No. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. Because you and I thrive off creating, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, it's just very, um, I don't know, I, I think the platform is bigger than ever. Well, you, you know firsthand, and I think both of us know firsthand, what we're capable of, you know, right. in our within our own little neighborhoods, neighborhoods like El Sereno had a awesome, thriving punk, hardcore punk scene. Yeah, I I like I owe so much to that scene, you know, to to the person I am today. Just meeting kids that just thought like me, that you know, just wanted to do things for themselves. They didn't look to anywhere else. They didn't, you know, they didn't com they didn't complain and just give up. They said, you know what, things are done. We don't like the way things are being done, so we'll just do it ourselves and you know we we had fun and we made great music and you know i i think that's just an example of what we're capable of as a people as a city you know you see it in you know the the, the fado do you know down in uh, fado do i dude, remember that, that place was just like amazing to me as a kid because i felt you know you go to you go to you go to that place and you'd see latin bands salsa bands ska bands punk i mean it was just just a, such a diversity and it really represented the city to me you know and i love that place a lot and i think you know we, that's that's the kind of stuff we're capable of as people i really believe that you know very interesting insight yeah. let's talk about food yes okay let's talk about an establishment that you like to go uh eat meals at or is there anywhere any, anywhere in downtown that you want to share god I, I think i think la to me you know i've i've been to new york i've been to san fran seattle you know i've and, you know, everyone claims that these cities have the best food in the country, but I, I believe L.A. can hold its own. Better L.A. Than, is the best. It's the best. For and You traveled me, a lot. Yeah, yeah, I've traveled a bunch. Um, same here, and I believe that, you know, when it comes to 
Consistency with food, LA is the best. The best. It is the best. I mean, when it comes to Mexican food, like Asian food, Thai food, Vietnamese, like there's just, I've had nothing like the stuff that's here anywhere else. It's, right. yeah. I mean, some of my favorite places, like for Asian food, San Gabriel Valley by far, uh, Newport Seafood, uh, Golden Deli, those places to me just gourmet, but so hole in the wall. It's just so funny. It's like gourmet hole in the wall food, but it's so damn good and so damn consistent. It, uh, yeah. It's really, it's really good. That's um, exciting. What else is good around here? You know, a lot of new restaurants here that I'm super excited about. Um, you know, with Baco Mercat, one mm -hmm. of them, and uh, Bar Ama, that's awesome. Um, Bestia over in uh, Santa, was on Santa Fe, I believe. Uh, and there's some new places opening up in the next year that I'm excited about, too. So I feel like we're finally getting our, our, our due. <laughs> Very exciting, Israel. I want to thank you for being a part of the 87th episode Thanks, of Los Eddie. Angeles Nista. I uh, really uh, value your uh, insight on all things Los Angeles. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And I was happy you were able to make this happen. Uh, thank you very much. Same here. Thanks.